Hello and welcome back to another episode of Study This, where we're going to review one of the chapters from Guyton and Hall's Medical Physiology. And today we're going over chapter 5, which is Membrane Potentials and Action Potentials. Just as the title suggests, it goes over how resting membrane potentials are formed across nerve cells and then how an action potential occurs. It's a rather confusing topic if it's your first time coming around to it, or maybe you're trying to revise and going over it again because it is a difficult concept to actually memorize. I hope you enjoy the video, and if you do, please give it a like and subscribe. It will help the channel out, and without further ado, we'll get straight into it. So the first basic principle that they go through with membrane potentials is imagining a normal nerve cell that has high potassium concentrations within the nerve fiber and very low outside the nerve fiber and then high sodium concentration on the outside and low sodium on the inside. In this membrane, it's, it's for now, it's just going to be permeable. So as you can imagine, where potassium is greater on the inside, you're going to have a diffusion of potassium across that membrane going down its concentration gradient and taking that positive charge with it. So you will create a negative charge within the nerve fiber as those potassium ions leave the cell. But eventually you'll end up with such a negative number within the cell that it starts to attract the positive potassium ions that have been diffused across the membrane. And then eventually that'll outcompete the concentration gradient and there will be an equilibrium. And that point is called the Nernst potential. And here is, this is what this is depicting and it's showing it it's negative 94 millivolts for potassium. Where that pull of the potassium back into the nerve fiber due to that negative charge within the fiber is negative 94 millivolts that's counteracting the diffusion of potassium down its concentration gradient to get out of the nerve fiber. The same thing occurs with sodium. So sodium, which has a high concentration outside of the cell, is going to diffuse down the concentration gradient into the cell. That's gonna drag its positive charge into the cell, create a positive charge within the cell, and eventually there's gonna be such a high positive charge within the cell, it's going to discourage more sodium from coming into the cell. And that is reached at plus 61 millivolts, which is a nerd's potential for sodium in this case. But obviously when we have multiple ions trying to diffuse across membranes, it can get rather confusing to determine exactly what that membrane potential is going to be. So there is an equation called the Goldman equation which takes all of these factors into account. So it takes the concentration of the ion, the permeability of the membrane to that ion into account to see exactly what resting membrane potential you're going to have as a result of that. And then there's various ways that they can actually measure it, but ultimately the resting membrane potential ends up being negative 90 millivolts within the nerve fiber. And it's like that because potassium can actually leak out of the cell, whereas sodium cannot leak into the cell. There is a greater permeability for potassium leaving the cell, taking that positive charge out and creating that negative resting membrane potential within the cell itself. And that's because of these potassium leak channels. Now you may be asking why is there you know, high potassium within the cell or high sodium outside of the cell? And that's concentration gradient is created by the sodium potassium pump which pumps out three sodiums out and two potassiums in. So that creates that concentration gradient through the conversion of ATP to ADP for our, as our energy currency. Now this sodium potassium pump does also contribute some to the resting membrane potential because it's taking three positive charges out of the cell and only letting two positive charges in. So it is creating a slightly negative environment because of this sodium potassium pump, but that only contributes a small portion. So roughly negative four millivolts is actually cr created due to that sodium potassium pump, whereas negative 86 millivolts is created because of those potassium leak channels, which is allowing a slow trickle of potassium out and a slow trickle of positive charge out of the cell creating a negative resting membrane potential. So since that negative resting membrane potential is the resting state, when there is an action potential, that's when 
there is a sudden opening of the sodium channels. So then sodium can rapidly diffuse into the cell and flip that resting membrane potential into a positive state since we have so much positive ions coming into the cell, the inside of the cell actually becomes positive. And that's depicted here where we have our resting membrane potential of negative 90, depolarization as all those sodium channels open and then those sodium channels actually eventually close and then there's an opening of more potassium channels which allows potassium to leak out of the cell and then we have repolarization bringing that charge back down to the resting membrane potential and that's what an action potential is is this depolarization and repolarization phase where there is a sudden opening of sodium channels allowing sudden influx of sodium and that occurs through these gates so at a resting state this sodium gate has an open inactivation gate and a closed activation gate once the signal occurs to open the activation gate that same signal will actually tell the inactivation gate to close but that closes at a much slower rate so we have a sudden influx of sodium as both are open and then eventually then the activation gate closes and we don't have any more sodium getting across the membrane. At the same time as those activation gates opening, we actually get these potassium gates also opening, but once again, just like the inactivation gates, they are opening at a much slower rate. So eventually they're able to open roughly at the same time that the inactivation sodium channels close. So then the potassium is able to leave the cell and repolarize the resting membrane potential and recreate that negative 90 millivolts. So that is essentially what an action potential is. And there's various ways to measure it as we can see here. Uh, but this right here really depicts what's going on for everything. So with the depolarization phase, there's a sudden increase in conductance of sodium as those channels are opening, and then a sudden cessation as the inactivation gates close. Then just past the peak, we have the opening of the potassium channels, which allows the potassium channels to the potassium ions to leave the cell, and then those eventually close as well as we get our resting membrane potential re-established. I know that's a, some confusing concepts, but you just have to go through it several times to try and get it stuck in your head. There are also other roles of other ions. The main ones that we'll focus on here are just some negative protein molecules or organic phosphates that sit within, this, within the cell, providing a nice ne little negative charge as well. Um, but then also calcium ions. And calcium ions are involved in the action potential in our cardiac muscle cells. Otherwise, it's just the sodium and potassium interplay that occurs with nerve cells. But with calcium ions in the heart, they also have a channel that opens and allows a rapid influx of calcium into the cell just after the sodium has entered, which then prolongs the action potential. And we will get to that. Uh, there is a little diagram in here, uh, but remember those are two separate action potentials, one for the cardiac muscle cell and then one for the nerve cell. There is a threshold for the initiation of an action potential. So uh, there is a number for which we will create the opening of those activation gates. So this is called the threshold for stimulation and that occurs at around negative 65 millivolts. So once that resting membrane potential hits negative 65 millivolts, bang, there's an opening of all the activation gates and all the sodium rushes in and we have a creation of an action potential. If it doesn't reach that threshold, we do not have an action potential. And then the action potential gets propagated across the nerve cell. And that occurs here. We have a nerve axon, which has its resting membrane potential negative on the inside. Once there is a opening or a reach of threshold, as in this region, and sodium is allowed to rush into the cell, we get a positive charge in the cell, which can then spread to the, the next door neighbors and create the threshold for those carrier proteins. So then sodium can rush in on these sides. And as you can see, this just forms a rapid propagation across the nerve cell and that comes down to the all or nothing principle where once you have the threshold being met there's going to be an action potential across the nerve cell and then you may be thinking okay if that occurs and you have your sodium coming into the cell 
and then you have a repolarization, so your resting membrane potential is re-established. Isn't there now going to be a high sodium channel, a high sodium content within the cell instead of it being outside of the cell? So shouldn't it not be able to work? Um, it's, it's a logical thought, except for there's such a high concentration of sodium outside the cell and it only takes a small quantity to diffuse across to create that depolarization that you don't actually abolish that concentration gradient at all. And not only that, the sodium potassium pump is so good at its job that it's able to re-establish that concentra concentration gradient. Once the sodium or the potassium enters or leaves the cell, there is theoretically a possibility of so many impulses that eventually that concentration gradient is reduced, but that occurs at between 100,000 and 50 million impulses. Uh, so as you can imagine, it almost never is reached. Now it does jump over to the plateau of some action potentials, which is, uh, as I was talking about with the calcium channels, where the calcium channels open after the sodium channels, calcium rushes into the cell, we get a plateau as the positive charge within the this nerve cell itself is maintained, even though potassium's rapidly leaving at the same time. Eventually those calcium channels close and then the potassium leaves the cell, achieves its goal of re-establishing re the resting membrane potential. Then if we talk about the automoticity of some cells which are able to create their own threshold without being stimulated, that's depicted here where you can see resting membrane potentials hit and then there's a slow increase in resting membrane potential until it hit, reaches threshold and then an action potential occurs. And that happens in some cells because the resting membrane potential never actually reaches the negative 90, it actually stays more around the negative 60, negative 70 millivolts. So some of those sodium inactivation gates never actually close or the activation gates never close so there's a slow leak of sodium into the cell which is allowing that slow increase in the slope until it reaches threshold and then it sends off another action potential and some cells have this function such as the pacemaker of your heart so then you can have a rhythmic impulse or a rhythmic depolarization so then your heart can contract at a rhythmic pace and keep you alive so it is an important feature of some cells. Then we also have the actual nerve trunk itself, which is depicted here. And what this is trying to show us is that we have so many little nerve axons and some of them are tiny, tiny like this guy and some of them are big like this guy, where some are covered in myelin and some aren't. And myelin is just a, almost like a fatty winter coat, which is made out of Schwann cells. And you can see it here where this is the myelin sheath over the nerve axon. Um, and then in between each of these myelin sheaths or these Schwann cells, we have the node of Ranvier. And what this allows nerve cells to do is perform a function called saltatory conduction, where action potential will only occur between the nodes of Ranvier. So the action potential then gets spread between each point because there is no movement of ions between these regions. That allows a very fast velocity down these axons and then also preserves some of the energy that is required for propagating an action potential because you don't have to use so much ATP for that sodium potassium pump. And then as we were talking about earlier, there are some impulses that never reach threshold and then therefore never result in an action potential. And these little stimuli can be a vast array of different things such as mechanical disturbance, so if it's a, a pressure receptor on your skin, if there's a certain pressure that may reach threshold, send off an action potential to then tell your brain, you know, there's pressure in that region. There's chemical effects, so whether that's uh, inflammation or a neurotransmitter um, that then causes a action potential to occur if it reaches threshold. And then you just have passage of electricity, which can then obviously propagate an action potential. But if there's a weak stimulus, then you don't actually get a action potential at all. But then we can also have a normal stimulus that would normally reach threshold and cause an action potential. But if it occurs at the wrong time in the refractory period, then it will not result in an action potential. And that occurs because the sodium channel channels are still inactivated. So even though the action potential wants to occur, 
Um, there is just no way for it to actually occur because those channels are closed. There's no way for the sodium to rush into the cell anymore. And it's like that because then you can have a re-establishment of your resting membrane potential and then fire again. You do also have some other factors which can influence the creation of an action potential. So when you have high calcium ion concentrations, that actually reduces the permeability to sodium channels or sodium ions. So that reduces the excitability of that cell and therefore calcium ions are said to be stabilizers. And then you got local anesthetics, which actually block those activation gates of the sodium channels altogether. So then you can't actually create any action potentials at all, and therefore can't feel pain, which would be the normal stimulus that you're trying to block with a local anesthetic. So that is the end of that chapter. I hope you enjoyed it. Please feel free to leave a comment. Otherwise, we'll see you in the next video.